What's up, guys? Hope you're feeling alive right now. I'm Mikey Keneally. And I'm Josiah Keneally. And we want to welcome you. You're tuning in to the Young Adults Today podcast, where we talk about reaching the next generation in our world today. And new episodes drop every Monday morning. We want to help you start your week off strong. How's your week going? Oh my gosh. I can't believe it's actually Wednesday in the studio today, but every Monday we kick off a new episode and it just feels like life is getting faster and faster. So if you are married or want to be married or you have kids or you want to have kids, oh my gosh, life just keeps going faster and faster. And it makes me realize how much more I just need to slow down, breathe and enjoy the moments. And sometimes the best place to do that is with friends and family around a table. That's good. And that's where we're going. We're on the that's table a great today. segue. We're going to be joined for today's episode by our friend, Katie Helgerson. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Of course. I'm doing good. It's great to be here. I'm, we're excited. Oh my gosh. Did I miss? <laughs> Say that again. I said, it's doing good instead of I'm doing good. So let's roll with it. <laughs> it's a Wednesday. <laughs> it's a Wednesday. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> We're excited, Katie, to have you on. I think the work that you're doing, we'll talk about it in just a second, is really Mm -hmm. cool. But when it comes to the next generation and young adult ministry, my passion is always Acts 2. And I think of this contagious early church community that at one point they gathered in each other's homes daily. They shared bread. They studied God's word. They shared everything together in common. And I've just always been inspired about the New Testament definition of community in Acts chapter two, that model. And we're Mm going to be talking. So if you want to grow in the area of hospitality, community building, I think that this episode, this conversation is really going to be for you. Katie is a hospitality Mm -hmm. educator and the owner of Gather Intentional Living and Everyday Hospitality. She's a public speaker, food stylist, writer, aspiring interior designer, and recipe developer. She is set out to see our generation come back to the table through hospitality. I think that's really cool. Side note, if you check out her Instagram, she has shark. shark. You did so well before we hit record. Say it again. comes out. You're in French class. Go. She has shark. (laughs) Shark charcuterie boards, <laughs> grown up lunchables <laughs> that are the bomb.com. And um, we'll have her talk about it and pronounce that word as I had a Fosbury <laughs> flop and epic fail. But we'll roll with that too. And I'll just say this about her organization Gather started as a small New England business and throughout the pandemic. Um, experienced what the world did, a lot of tremendous growth Mm. as they pivoted to virtual. And so they welcome guests from all 50 states, six countries through their hundreds of workshops, um, cake decorating, hospitality, education. And I'll try it one more time. Char. Get it, get it, get it. (laughs) Char. Tutory boards. Hey, we're going to go with it. All right, I'll I'll stop butchering it, but thanks for joining us. And man, can you redeem that moment for us? (laughs) The amount of variations I've heard, you know, of the pronunciation. Oh my gosh, I should take like recorded clips. Um, So charcuterie. Charcuterie. It sounds so much better when she says it, doesn't it? Charcuterie. It's It's more fun. Charcuterie. Try it. Try it. Charcuterie. Charcuterie. Oh, see? But I will just say this that I practiced before we hit record (laughs) and I nailed it. Well, it just shows that we're learning, right? Yeah. Undereducated. We are trying to be better people of understanding words, vocabulary, and culture. Charcuterie. (laughs) Oh, you got your two. Yeah, you got it twice. I believe in you. We're turning a page here. Yes, (laughs) let's do it. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Katie, can you just share with us? I love your bio, by the way. Like I, I love, I have the gift of hospitality and the gift of faith are two of my strongest ones. And when it comes to food, when it comes to a design, when it comes to people, when it comes to places, I want to leave things, people, and places better than I found them. And wow. I want them to experience the beauty of food, the beauty of a space, a beauty of a backyard, whether it's just adding decorative lights and a couple of rugs and a couple of throws and pillows, just making, making people feel at home when many people don't have a home to call home, right? We work with a lot of young adults. Maybe they're in the dorms. They're trying to figure out life, all these different elements, but also for the people hosting Bible studies, how do we make a place feel 
more beautiful with a gift and a skill set that maybe you have as an individual. And I would love for you just to share with the audience more of your journey and your story of, of how you got to where you are at in life today. Can you just take us there for a moment? Whoa. Yeah. Well, that was powerful. I was just basking in that for a minute, the way that you said that and your vision for that is so sweet. Um, and I think something that we all crave a lot of the listeners as, as they're listening today. So, um, as you guys said, my name is Katie, I am born and raised from are born and raised in Connecticut. There we go. I'm one of three girls and my Italian heritage and background is a huge part of just like how I see the world and interact with the table. So my Italian grandpa is to thanks for that. Um, we ended up moving a lot as kids just with brokenness in our childhood home. And so like something like nine times before my senior year, I moved in high school, not even college. (laughs) And so a lot of new faces, which I loved as an extrovert, but with that, a ton of bullying as well, which was very impactful in those, you know, foundation years. Right. Um, but this all led me to my junior and senior year. I went to a private Christian, um, high school and, through that experience, God really showed me for the first time what radical Christian community looked like um, in the best way. So it was it was intentional. It was um, unconditional. It was constant. And I wanted more of it. And so when I graduated high school, I ended up going to Messiah College in Pennsylvania, which was kind of like the 2.0 of my high school. <laughs> and I found um, found my husband Colby there. We've been married for seven years. But really, um, through this experience, what was most um, the reason why I think God allowed me to go there, go to Messiah. I studied social work. I'm not using it anymore, (laughs) but was really, he called us. Um, we felt a strong pull to go to Thailand and, um, we went there just to study abroad to start. But then while we were there, we felt God calling us to move there. And so we graduated college, um, got married and moved there and served for about four years. Um, and while we were there, we could talk about this a little bit more later in the conversation. Um, but I experienced this loneliness that was kind of like the deepest loneliness I'd felt in my life. It kind of was just the cherry on top. Um, and I felt like an invitation from God to really make hospitality and hosting my own. That's so good. I think that I think a very similar story to me, like I felt like God called me out. Like if you're not experiencing the community that you desire, then create the community, invite people around the table. Yeah. We call that you go first hospitality. Well, there it is. There Uh it is. And I felt like that was really not, maybe not understanding the gift of hospitality or the desire to see people grow around the table. And we have a motto and a theme, even at our house, um, when it comes to ministry or at our table, it's like, there's always room for more. You just squeeze a little tighter, add another chair, you put another leaf in the table, whatever that is and means like there's always room at the table. And I think, um, just having you just start off your story there of recognizing, a need and and meeting that need, not only for yourself, but for others in the process. So love that. And isolation and loneliness is something that we can all relate to. Yeah. It's something that the word of God definitely describes and definitely speaks to. And I just believe this, that godly community is the cure to isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I would just be curious, and, and this might be where, but like, where did your passion then jump? Because you've gone all in with like hosting and hospitality. Was it out of that deep pain that then this passion came from? Yeah. So I would say my first love definitely started with my Nana and the slow cooked, you know, Italian meals every Sunday and those types of things, right. That you, you hear those Italian stories often, but what I realized as I was really, so, okay. So I felt this loneliness and just like you, Micah, I had this invitation from the Lord to either do something about it or to sit back and accept it. So I was like, this is going to be a long, painful three years if I don't do something. So that's when I started to extend invitations to people and fill our house. So I would put food out naturally, right? Because that's what we know to do, but I still felt like there was a lack of connection. And so I felt like the Holy Spirit really peeled back the layers on what we're missing in current hospitality culture. And what that was to me was the combination of three things. We need um, design, uh, an equal focus on design, relationship, and food. You can't just have one without the other. Wow. Right. I agree. Yeah. And so I guess the passion, um, I'll end this statement here, well, um, ended when I saw just how impactful the table was for these connections and ways that other areas of our life weren't. I love that. And do you remember the first time you made your first 
I'm not even going to say it. Your first for beautiful, it. beautiful board <laughs> of food. <laughs> we say it. Did you say it? No, I did not. I don't... Char. Say you... Char. Cooterie. Oh, you got it. Okay. Look You're at you. One. Do you remember when I botched it like nine times on a podcast episode? You know what I feel like? I feel like this is me. Like I am learning. I am now my daughter. And I'm like, Aurora, this is how you say it. <laughs> say it again. Say it again. <laughs> Oh, we had these God. t-shirts made early on in the business that kind of had it written out phonetically so that you could say like people knew how to say it. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody at the table should have to try to say it and wear it. You have to make it a game of some sort. Oh my gosh. Well, do you remember making your first board? <laughs> <laughs> I believe in us by the end of this conversation. Uh... <laughs> um, yeah. So this is actually a really funny story. So Throughout our years in Thailand, I had been cooking. We actually had a bakery there through the missions work that we were doing. So I had done a lot of baking. Um, I was very comfortable in the kitchen, but I had actually never made a proper Instagram worthy cheese board. So um, it's a funny story. So we got back to the States. I opened a bakery and catering company here. I felt like God was calling us to switch our model from just passing off the food to actually teaching people to kind of giving them the skills. And I didn't know how that was going to start. So one day I was randomly in this gift store. I mean, just like shopping. I didn't think it was going to be a divine encounter. (laughs) And I was walking past the bathroom. The owner walked out, basically tripped over me. And the words just came out of my mouth. I was like, have you ever hosted workshops here? And she was like, no, but I'd love to. What do you teach? And I said, charcuterie. It just came out of my mouth. And I was like, holy spirit, what are you doing? (laughs) I have never made a cheese board. And she was like, let's do it. And so she booked, um, I think it was like five workshops. They all sold out. And I was like, well, I better learn how to make these boards. And the first class was super cringy. I like deleted all the pictures from our Instagram page. (laughs) But what God did was he grew this skill set in me um, in how to design them intentionally and teach people what they need to be confident making their own. I will say I made my first charcuterie board probably when I was in like fifth grade because every holiday, my mom and dad, like they always host every single holiday. So it was a meat, cheese, crackers. There's always fruit. There's always veggies, like homemade pickles, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then you get into the shrimp rings. So it's like, we always had this large spread. So even when Josiah and I first got, well, we were dating and he came, he's like, does this happen like every holiday or every time you go home? I'm like, yeah, this is like the tradition. Like if it's a of it. July, if it's Christmas, I'm like, there's homemade checks mix. Like there is everything. And it is a buffet. And it's probably only like what eight of us or 10 of us. But if you go home hungry, that's your own fault. So maybe it was an art in my mind before it was actually an art in the real world. Well, I really, I really started to ask God, like, why did you let this word out of all the words that could have came out of my mouth? Why, why that one? Cause it birthed something in our business. Yes. Um, wow. but I felt like the Holy spirit showed me so many people are so, um, intimidated by cooking a cheese board doesn't require any heat. Usually it just requires like a few skills. And especially with our culture, if you look at Instagram for five minutes, you're going to see charcuterie boards, right? Like the perfect ones. And so by giving this skill, it gives people like just the confidence to at least have people over and serve them something they feel good about. Katie, I feel like you are like biblically, like you are teaching a man how to fish, like you're teaching them how to have a skill set and not just allow them to encounter it once, but allow them to teach, be taught and then teach others. Um, and yeah. then provide those opportunities. So wow, you talk food and fun all day. Go so. Oh my gosh, slide. I really could. So <laughs> lead <Seriously>. the way. <laughs> and, and, you know, like I think that it's isn't it interesting. Like when when you're hosted somewhere or you reciprocate or you initiate and you're having people over, it's interesting that like Mikey used the example of when we go to North Dakota to visit her mm-hmm. family. Like now we've been married over five years. I am completely comfortable opening their fridge, um, going through any of the cupboards, but that's like a degree of comfort. It's almost like a measure of how close you are in a relationship is like the friends, have you been in their home? Can you tell them you're thirsty versus you yeah. know, waiting for an offer? Yeah, <laughs> asking for something to drink or even just the boldness of like some of our closest friends, we try to get together at least once a month with all of our families. And sometimes it's a little crazy with a lot of kids and stuff, but if you're, com- if I, I can tell you if I'm comfortable somewhere, if I would open somebody's fridge. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. um, 
I would just be curious. So say, I, I think this is a genius idea too, Ooh, but say yeah. there's like a young adult ministry leadership team, or say there's a young adult pastor and their, their spouse or even their mm-hmm. ministry. And they want to sign up for one of your classes or courses. Yeah. Talk about those for a second. Yeah, for sure. So throughout the pandemic, I mean, we were hosting these classes like five to seven a week. It was crazy, all cheese board. Um, But as the world and all virtual, so people were in in one class, we'd have like many different states represented, Um, but the world is changing again. So what that looks like now is we definitely host private events where you can have us and your community. Um, or we have pre-recorded classes in our hospitality academy that you could um, you could take buying them individually or with a membership. But I think what I'm pushing right now, or not pushing, but really um, standing behind and trying to grow, is I, I would love to come to your communities and equip and inspire you guys. I think that what was happening was I was becoming known as the cheese girl. <laughs> and I feel like God is casting this new vision of these three pillars coming together food design and relationships. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack and to learn there. Oh my does that answer your question? It does a hundred percent. And I would just okay. say like, you might be thinking of your next event and in ministry. So often we think of the church service right? and who's going to lead worship and who's going to preach a message. And I have been to, I think for my age, my fair share mm-hmm. of gatherings and worship is vital. And part of worship actually is fellowship. Right. And community. And I just think right now, this idea was not on our script at all, but I'm just going to challenge and encourage some of the listeners today to think about like booking Katie for your next event, whether it is virtual right. or in person. I just think that what a powerful way to gather at your church in somebody's like a house party. What a great deal of like having food mm-hmm. centering around these things of design food, food relationship. and relationship. Like yeah. what a great vision. Well, in addition yeah. to that, just for the the pastors, we, so we've been a part of many Bible studies. Like, so we always have a Bible study going on, whether we are leading it or we're leading it through the church. And sometimes, you know, I've walked into some Bible studies and it's like, okay, they're serving water and that's it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're right. just like, okay, I came from yeah. work and I'm starving. So then people come in with their little snack bags. Oh, I went to Chick-fil-A. I went to McDonald's. I got a sub, whatever. And it's like, wow, like how can we create a culture within our ministry or our small groups where everybody signs up to bring something and then we create it together. So we even had this one, they called it cake community. I don't remember what it all was. It was acronym. Oh, that's cute. Yes. <laughs> Our but friend, he's like actually that. on our board of our ministry, yeah. now, but he was a volunteer leader in our young adult ministry. Mm-hmm. And he came to me with the idea of a small group for yes. young adults. It was and, brilliant. And they'd cook every week and study God's word. Yeah. So they come together, wow. each bring their own ingredients. Like, Hey, we're making a Spanish dish and we're making, you know, Spanish rice, the tacos bring whatever. So they had to sign up sheet and then make it together. Then they would enjoy their meal and get into the word of God. And I think even for what Katie's doing for the listener of Maybe this is a team building exercise for your, yeah. for your team that's leading. So if you yeah. have 30 people leading 30 different Bible studies, maybe bring those 30 mm-hmm. leaders in and teach them how to do something fun. And then they can yeah. take it into their homes. Obviously that's what we kind of want to do is Amazing. multiply and replicate, you know, not only what you're doing, but just the heart of hospitality and the process yeah. of discovering the heart of Christ. For sure. Um, and speaking of young adult ministry, we love to have young adults in our home. Um, and obviously you've, you're, you've been a young adult, you've come across probably just multiple mm-hmm. individuals and people, whether it's in a different country yeah. or right here in the States yeah. and just the importance of, um, just community in, and life. And I would just be curious, Katie, why do you believe that young adult ministry is so vital and important, whether, it, whether it be coming around the table, coming around a community, like where does your heart kind of poll when I ask you that question. Wow. So, um, I might get teary, but anyways, those two years, it was Christian heritage school in Trumbull, Connecticut. Um, I, I was a good kid raised in a Christian home, but just a lot of brokenness. And I feel like if I didn't go to that Christian school, I would have just been stuck. I feel I could, I could look back and see it. I feel like the cycle would have just continued with these certain patterns of brokenness. And these two years, I mean, yes, it was school, but it was also young adult ministry, like really at, especially the upper school. Um, At the same time, like I said, even though I was a believer, I was introduced to young life, which totally was like, like earth shattering for me (laughs) in like a good way. And um, 
I don't know. I just, I look at those years. I don't know what you guys, what years do you classify as young adult? So we consider young adults between the ages of 18 to 30. So that 12 year of pivotal (laughs) decision-making. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I just think of those years that I had these mentors that were so new to me, sit me down and talk to me about different options for college for the first time that let me dream for the first time that encouraged me to go on a plane for like the second time, 20 hours across the world, you know? And if it wasn't for these people that God sent, I, I wouldn't be here. I feel like they helped me rewrite lies in my life, um, that wouldn't have otherwise been rewritten. Is so good. So good. I think so relatable for many of the listeners, whether they are young adults or they're leading or they're trying to discover what's next is to stop believing the lies of the enemy or the story that we've been telling ourselves when God has already rewritten our story. And Mm -hmm. we just get to step into it. Like our character is being built. We just have to start trusting that God is going to, you know, be the one that truly is the one that's renewing us every day. That's going to reform the way we think. And the, and the Mm -hmm. word of God will be, you know, come to life in a new way, hopefully. And it does not come back void because of all those promises that we can see and uncover, even whether it's acts two or who God says we are as his children. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what a beautiful thing to realize that young adult ministry is important. Um, Youth is important. The 55 plus community, every every stage and age is important um but to make sure that nobody's getting overlooked at the table and to know that yeah. there's a seat waiting for them but they're one invitation away so yeah wow so good mm-hmm. what would your encouragement katie to be maybe to a young leader who is growing in the area of hospitality like how can they take maybe, it to the next yeah, level how can they get started mm-hmm. or take things wow. to the next level so my fur the first thing that I always say, um, and actually I'm writing a book and you guys, I'll share this more with you later, but I think the first thing I'm saying, the whole intro is don't wait, even though it will be a book about food design and relationships, don't let anything stop you. Um, finances, space, shame, <laughs> any of these things. Like I think we, the enemy has been become very creative with the roadblocks to hospitality. And it's not even just money and space anymore. It's childhood bullying, it's shame, it's clothes, it's appearance, it's all of these things, right? And what's happening is we're seeing the consequences in our culture, in our own lives. If you read John Deloney's new book, I know that you guys are a fan. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> he he talks about like the physical effects of loneliness, like actually it being stronger and more powerful than um, smoking cigarettes. And so I think that there is ways to obviously cultivate more meaning in our gatherings, but my ultimate encouragement, or there's always ways to grow. Right. But my ultimate encouragement would be don't wait. That's so good. I think that's something that resonates with us, even in our transition of life. It wasn't, it wasn't even like, don't wait. It's like the time is now. Like what greater time to yeah. be in tune with God and be obedient? It's now. There's an immediate obedience yeah. and this pressing timeline of the kingdom that's going to come down to earth in a, you know, soon enough, right? It's here, but it's yeah. the, the next stage is going to come. But mm-hmm. what are we doing to prepare and how are we taking people with us, right? So yeah, it's so good. Well, I remember being a young adult myself okay. and having a lot of friends who were, you know, asking faith questions, maybe starting to invite themselves to church and just asking hard questions. And we were doing life together. And my pastor, he said, Hey, Josiah, why don't you um, invite some of your friends over to my house and I'll feed them and we'll do wow. like maybe a backyard, you know, Barbecue. and people were inside the house, outside the house. And he lived in a cul-de-sac and I remember the cul-de-sac ran out of parking. People were parking at a park, <laughs> like across the street. And by the end of the night, over a hundred young adults had shown up and he fed them all. It was probably it. more than any of us were expecting. <laughs> and a lot of the people didn't even necessarily know that they were in a pastor's home. Right. Yeah. But you couldn't open the door because it was filled with shoes. And that's one of my wow. favorite things is in a house when like, you have to struggle a little bit to, <laughs> yeah. to use some muscle to push some somebody's shoes out of the way. And I just remember, and also young adults still talk about going to Pastor Jerry's house mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the backyard, there was like a volleyball court and a trampoline and um, like a bonfire mm-hmm. pit. And he and another friend were grilling and just, I just look at the, the mark that that left on me too, mm-hmm. Yeah, that 
he was yeah. pastoring a large church, but he mm-hmm. had time to invite me into his home and my mm-hmm. friends into his home. And that's something yeah. that we like also believe mm-hmm. as a philosophy yeah. of ministry is we probably wouldn't consider ourselves somebody's pastor mm-hmm. or spiritual leader unless they have been in our home. And they might not consider us a spiritual leader until they're in our home. Yeah, right? probably not. Wow. You know, yeah. and, and I just think that that's um, sometimes a missing ingredient in mm-hmm. our world today is that personal connection, mm-hmm. the authentic yeah. relationship. And everyone's looking for a pastor. Everyone's looking for a friend. I think yeah. college students especially are looking for a place to have a home cooked meal. Right. Because as yeah. cafeterias serve food, it's not the same <laughs> as no, made no. with love. <laughs> yeah. Two things are coming to mind. So I mentioned quickly that I studied social work. That's what I went to school for. And there's this, um, diagram Maslow's hierarchy of needs yes. I'm with it. Right. And so I think that it's like food and or it's shelter and then like food and water. And then I think belonging is third. And so we like to think, I feel like as a culture, we've shifted from a childhood focus on creativity and community to independence and success. Wow. But we're, and- we're trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we think it's totally fine to just replace it, <laughs> to replace that need for community, but we're seeing the effects of it in such a powerful way. So it is an actual need, <laughs> I mean, for, for health. Um, and I was at church this past week and the pastor was preaching on hospitality. God's just like showing this over and over and over again. It's a theme. And I haven't study this myself, but our pastor said that the word Hebrew, maybe <laughs> Greek <laughs> for, um, hospitality is the same as hospital. Have you heard wow. that? Wow. So wow. how God uses hospitality in scripture as like a place for healing. That's so good. And I would e- I have even to do my own research. But- <laughs> yeah. But even just think about how many tables and conversations that you've been around or that you like Katie, you've been around, or I've been around, like just the, the testimonies that come, the deep, real, meaningful, authentic relationships that we've been investing in, or the home cooked meal of a college student that's like, I've never had a home cooked meal. Like I've never been invited over to somebody's house like this or in this way. What do I feel here? Yeah. And, oh, it's the presence of the Lord. Oh, it's peace. Oh, this is yeah. this is community. Like, can I come back? Like when when people yeah. ask if they can come back, and it's like, well, yes, you can come. We're meeting next Thursday. Like we'll be here. So even to yeah. be a form of consistency in community yeah. around a table um, is huge, especially when dinners and meals are not taking place in the households of of anybody right now. When one out of four um, youth are actually being raised in a home. Uh, with one out of four is not being raised in a home with both parents and oh, wow. that's millions. I mean, 24% yeah. do not have two parents in a household. And I don't even know the statistics of how many are not having meals together at supper time because of the fast pace yeah. survival that we're living. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. And we'll come back to this in just a second, but I remember on this podcast one time, Levi Lusco gave me an assignment. Pastor Levi's like, mm-hmm. study for your next message, ATMs. Oh yeah. Yeah. And automated teller machines. It was like this guy, he was in a long bank line and it used to be that you'd like small talk or chit chat or get to know the person ahead of you uh-huh. and behind you. And he was so frustrated with the long wait that he made, like, there's got to be a more efficient, efficient, (laughs) effective way to do it. But then the result, and we see this now that there's self-checkout at Target and and anywhere almost. Right. And there's even some Amazon stores. And I've been to one where you don't even encounter another person. You, you scan your items and then it automatically, like anything you put in your cart, it charges you, but it all kind of started with the ATM. It was like mm-hmm. one of now over a wow. hundred relational tasks um, or errands that people would run that have now been replaced by like a computer chip or a Almost do-it-yourself like, yeah. service. The real interaction, right? And we've yeah. taken relationship out of community and society. And there's mm-hmm. even sociologists that have studied the effect of the ATM. Right. Crazy. Wow. There's one more word of advice I could give, and it's not to ignore friend, random friend chemistry. And so I talk about this on our podcast um, and in our book a little bit, but what it means, like, so if we're looking at adult friendship or young adult, how do we make friends when we're out of college, especially because we're not surrounded by those people anymore, right? 
So right now, one of my best friends was previously my bank teller (laughs) and I go out to dinner almost once a week with the lady at UPS. So here's what happens. I'm not trying to put myself on like a pedestal or anything. There's just something I learned from it. We're all looking for friends. And Mm -hmm. I feel like just like dating, we are aware of chemistry with people, right? Like when you have something in common, when you're, I don't know, your interest is sparked. I don't know. (laughs) And so to not ignore that and to actually go first and initiate some kind of um, time around the table. So what that looked like for me is I kept going to the bank every Friday, depositing my husband's checks because his boss still does that. (laughs) And I hit it off with this girl. And eventually I said, do you want to hang out? And she's like, I was hoping you'd ask. Um, And so we've been, we've become best friends. That's incredible. What a great challenge. Even for the pastor, sometimes you come across people like, oh, I'm capped out in the friend department or I can't even manage my own life. And, but really what we're, we're asking for is more people to be a part of it. It just needs to come out of us in a way that don't, it's not weird. It's not weird. That's what I want to end on. It's not weird. People want it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. Well, Katie, we've come to the part of our episode. Are you ready for the five and five challenge Go for it? Yeah. Five questions, five minutes, kind of five minutes on the clock. Just said, do you want to kick us off? Let's go. Okay. Let's go. (laughs) Question number one. So I'd be curious your favorite snack or meal. Oh, snack or meal. Darn it. Okay. So there's this ice cream shop near us that makes homemade ice cream. I'm dairy free. They make a dairy free vanilla funfetti. And I'm not usually a funfetti girl, but they make their own sprinkles and I've been going there way too much. It's been a very frequent snack. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, my next question was be, what would be your favorite cheese? But if you're dairy free, I don't know. What well, no, I'll have. answer. I'll answer. Yes, I found good. Do. Do. Yeah. So I can tolerate goat milk cheeses and Trader okay. Joe's has goat milk, brie, Gouda and cheddar, and they are phenomenal. Good choices. Good choices. What about this one? What's something that you, we'd find you doing on a, a day off as a hobby for fun. Uh, so my hobby and my business blurs a lot, but (laughs) recently I've been seeing a lot of textured painting DIY on Instagram. And so I'm trying my hand at textured painting. (laughs) All right. Is it on a canvas or is it like on a wall canvas? And oh my gosh, Josiah, you might know, I don't know what this stuff is called. You buy it at the hardware store. It's like a putty. Yeah. Texture. Yeah. Yeah, Let's go for it. I don't know what it's called, but I can link it if someone wants to find it. I have a big bucket of it waiting for some vases to do that with. So (laughs) you're speaking my language and maybe I'll learn (laughs) calculatory. Okay. Number four, if you could ask us a question, Katie, uh, what would you ask us today? Ministry related, non-ministry, anything you want in your it's, it's related to this conversation, but, um, with your experience, what are ways that we as everyday hosts what are ways that we can make young adults feel more comfortable at our table? Ooh. Do Either to- conversationally or let's say maybe conversationally is a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. I think that where I go with it is sometimes um, I've done this with people where, oh, they're the lead pastor of a church. So they're not as approachable, but be willing to share something that quickly shows you as human like Mm. wow tell something about a fun fact or a boring fact or the hobby that you have or you know the sports team that you're following that you're into because I think we do this with like okay the CEO of an organization Mm -hmm. guess what they are a person too with interests Mm -hmm. and you know so I think that sometimes people have put like maybe the founder of an Apple or whatever. I'm just staring at a a Apple device. And (laughs) like, I think that what people forget is that they're people and they need friends to your point about the person at the bank or a friend or a young adult that would be in our house. Like, I think that they need to Mm -hmm. see that I mispronounce words sometimes (laughs) that that I'm all right. Like, okay, I'm, if, if you, if you know me, I'm going to be funny sometimes, but goofy. And I'm going to get my words mixed up. And that's just, it's just part of humanity. And so I would say, if you can just show your humanness, um, don't be afraid of it. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, I would say be a host or be an individual that can ask deep, meaningful 
open-ended questions yeah. because the next yeah. generation is longing to be challenged in the way that they live and the way that they think and the way that they process um, mm-hmm. all those different things. Like they want to know that you care when you ask deep, meaningful questions that is not, I mean, not probing in a bad way, but like, yeah. Oh, like, well, tell me about your upbringing. Like, what are your dynamics or tell me about like your family? Like, what are your, what do you, do you guys do anything fun for the holidays? What does your spread look like? Um, cause everybody has their own traditions. Maybe they didn't, you know, celebrate something or maybe birthdays yeah. are a big deal. Or maybe it's like my family where it's like a full spread of every meat, cheese, cracker, <laughs> whatever, shrimp rings and everything and beyond. And you're just like, oh my gosh, like that's part of our tradition. We're sick of Turkey by December. We have prime rib, like, and we have Turkey at Thanksgiving. So mm-hmm. even just talking deep, meaningful conversations start literally around the table. And when you can stop asking the yes and no questions, it yeah. just, causes them to have an opportunity to share whether they're an introvert or extrovert and it just decreases their fear and it increases their curiosity. So mm-hmm. when you can do that and um, do that through questions, they really appreciate it. Even if they feel like they might be stiff arming you and they don't want to be known, they're longing yeah. to be known. So, wow. That's what Man, I say. So powerful. Yeah. So good. Super fun. What about, oh, how about oh this my- Katie to close? Like you know, we've talked a lot about hospitality and the next generation and just yeah, the gift of community that it is. And I, I'm, I'm just picturing all of us in a room, right? And we hand you the yeah. microphone and you could give every listener one piece of advice or encouragement. What would you yeah. want us to know? Mm-hmm. Uh, can I repeat my one from before? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. I think- yeah, I think it's like just super heavy on my heart these days. The not, uh, oh my gosh, what, how did I say it before? Don't wait. Is that what yeah. I said before? Yeah. How do yeah. I not don't remember wait. my own advice? Don't, don't wait. wait. <laughs> Two words. Yeah, don't wait. <laughs> don't wait. So don't let anything stand in your way. Um, I think uh, hospitality is in some ways a muscle that needs to be practiced ex- or like to be grown, especially if it wasn't, um, how our childhood, like, like homes, if that was not what was shown to us. And so just start practicing. Um, uh, remember the rule of threes when you're inviting people and reaching out. Um, if someone says no, the first time, give yourself the permission to reach out three times before you move on to someone new. Um, yeah. And just, yeah, again, just don't, don't let anything stop you. This generation and yourself, <laughs> you all need hospitality and it starts with your table. That's great. We're all one invitation away, not only from sitting at somebody's yeah. table, but even experience a relationship with Jesus Christ. So yeah, keep inviting so people, true. keep leaning in, right, Katie? <laughs> yeah. Keep leaning in. Yeah. Find that community <laughs> and um, so just see what God does. I mean, sometimes don't let guilt or shame hold you back from yeah where you've come from or who you're not, but keep, you know, pressing into who God's created you to be and keep discovering what that is and looks like for you. So that's what comes to my mind. It's good. The rule of threes. I've never heard of that. I love it. Yeah. Cause I think we're a generation that gets offended really easily or it's a time in history where there's a lot of offense. And so we're, people are scared of rejection. And so if you reach out the first time and they say, no, we, we shut the door right away, but sometimes people need need time to process. And a huge part of my story that we didn't even get in today, and I won't go there is I had to learn how to receive an invitation after being bullied. And so for me that when someone gives themselves the permission to reach out to me three times, it allows me to warm up to the idea. So I think a lot of culture is related to that. That's powerful. I'm going to take that as my challenge because I think I've I've done that, whether it was an invitation to church or anything like, oh, they said, no, like I'll stop asking, but giving them the benefit of the doubt and um, Mm -hmm. the most non-threatening invite that I've ever heard of was our friend Doug and he would invite his coworkers, but he'd say, if I was to invite you to church, if I were to ask you to come to this event, what would you say? And I felt like that was such an, uh, a low oh. pressure, mm-hmm. low threatening way. Oh, okay. I won't ask then. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, okay. Then you should come. Here's the details. But if I were to ask you, I just, I love that. Yeah. And, um, but I'm going to take that as my challenge of be willing to ask more than once. It's good. Yeah. Good. I'm so glad. Wow. Well, Katie, <laughs> thanks so much uh, for the great conversation, for who you are, for what you're doing. It's really powerful. Of course. Thanks so much, guys. It's been a joy.
Absolutely. And if you're listening, you find you want to find out more about Katie and gather intentional hospitality, we will put the links in the show notes and on our website at Young Adults Today and online on social media. So until next time, this is Josiah and Micah saying, talk soon. Don't let the fear get in the way, right? That's right. Here we go. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>